Hey folks, welcome back to the next episode of The Main Scoop. I'm Greg Lotko, and you're not Daniel. There's too much hair. <laughs> well, I, I, I won't go into that comment, but unfortunately Daniel couldn't join us today, but we have with us Stephen Dickens from Futurum as well. Stephen, why don't you tell us a bit about yourself? Yeah, Greg, thanks. Well, great to be on the show. My name's Stephen Dickens. I'm a practice leader here at the Futurum Group. I cover everything from hybrid cloud infrastructure and operations. So basically all the stuff that makes IT work. And I always think that's interesting when folks say they're a practice leader. That means you lead practicing or when do you perfect it? I'm, I'm still working on it. Okay. But basically that's all of our research, all of our advisory, all of our written and commissioned content for the whole, whole of that technology stack. Okay. So the mainframe's part of that, but I also get to work with all the hyperscalers, all of the software and infrastructure people who make IT work. Very cool, very cool. So we're gonna be talking about blockchain and emerging technologies or newer technologies today. What are you, uh, you, know, what are you thinking? Well, I think we're in an inflection point. Where is, we've obviously, banking's one of those big traditional industries lots of investment in technology over the decades but if you look at where they are from a cloud adoption point still really early so five percent low single digits is what people are saying from a, an adoption point so still a lot of transformation left to do people are still looking at transactional systems there's obviously a new tech stack emerging and we'll get into that but a lot of transformation still ahead huge budgets big teams lots of things to think about. So, huge budgets, I mean, that doesn't mean limitless. I mean, It folks, certainly doesn't mean limitless. Folks have to make sure that they keep the bank running, that they're doing what they need to allow us to make our deposits, withdrawals, do our mortgages, all that kind of stuff. But, so it's, it's really innovation while you're keeping it going, right? It's rebuilding the train while it's on the track. Exactly, so these guys have faced, I think, with a really different challenge around, you've got to transform the bank while making sure the bank stays running. Mm -hmm. Massively regulated industry. Not allowed to lose money. Yeah, not allowed well, to lose. Well, at least not allowed to lose our money. Well, that's, that's the key thing. So security's top of mind for these mm -hmm. guys, operational resilience. How do they keep the bank running whilst transforming at the same time? So it's almost doing a heart and lung transplant on the marathon runner whilst they're running the race. It's kind of the analogy that I use. I think I like the train analogy better. It, it, the rest of it gets a little painful, but but we have an expert joining us today. Indeed. Why don't you introduce Claire to our audience? So I've known Claire for years from our time at a previous company that shall not be named, Claire Adolgren from EY. Thank you. Welcome to the here. show. Thank you very nice much. So tell us a little bit about your role and what you do for EY. So my role at EY, I'm the global head of uh, blockchain operations and sales enablement uh, at EY. We've been on the journey for a good eight years now, and we're building products on public uh, Ethereum. We choose to focus on Ethereum, but we're building public blockchain solutions. So we were just talking a little bit there in the intro about where the industry's going, how banking's starting to adopt distributed ledger technology as a foundational layer. What are you seeing? What's the type of trends that are coming through? I, I think I view it as slightly differently. I, first of all, you have to take a step back. With any emerging technology, you've got to take a step back and say, why the technology? What's distinct about it? Blockchain's very distinct in that it's got its very unique characteristic of being a distributed ledger with a very distinct flavor. And that provides you with trust, transparency, immutability. And it's for the use cases where that's uniquely required is what I would say. But I like the way you started it and, and, and the way you ended it, your book ended it. You said, first you gotta ask why the technology and yes. for its use cases. So it's, it's not blockchain everywhere for everything. Where's the, the real value in, in banking? I, well, I think I see there's a, two different ones. The very obvious one is the first use case that everybody knows when they think of blockchain, they think of cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very mature. Uh, it's been around for a long time now. Uh, I don't think there's a, a dispute to that. I think it's a worthy use course. It, it, the use case would be translated today, the correct way to think about it is digital assets. 
uh, what does that look like for any bank? So that's, that for me is an expansion of existing portfolio offerings. It's an expansion of products, it's an expansion of services, and that's what it means for the banks. Then there's a use case for blockchain technology, which would be very similar for the banks as it is for any other enterprise that's out there. And this is really at that intersection of where enterprises, how they transact and interact. And that's looking more at what's the opportunity of a programmable smart contract and what you can do with that. Be that, you know, in the digital assets world, that could be syndicated loans. But in an enterprise level, it can be using contracts, managing large managed contracts between enterprises on an immutable ledger so that you have one version of it between parties. Has it, has it lived up to the hype? I mean, I feel like, yeah, I mean, I feel like five years ago, maybe six years ago, probably even a little longer now, it was like, wow, blockchain is gonna take over the financial industry. This is how everybody's going to do it. Um, obviously, cryptocurrency was a big use case, but it was, there's gonna be a big push into the traditional brick and mortar banks as they go online and everything, but it, I, is it just that I'm not hearing about it as much and the technology is underneath? Or has it kind of sputtered? And if so, why? I think I go back to the use case a little bit. And what I would say is that, first of all, it's very early on. And we all know the Gartner hype cycle and, mm -hmm. and, and that you can, look at, you can look for the exact same story if you look at cloud, the early stage of the cloud. Oh, I agree. And you we, can look for the exact same well, story. We are with AI and, right and now. Today we're we talking talked about, about AI. this across a lot of technologies, that a lot of technologies, it's a big hype. It's going to replace everything. Yeah. And, and this stuff takes time. But so what I will fair. say to you is, uh, I mean, a fairly recent survey that we've done with, with banks out there, to give you a flavor of, so how big is it when we think about digital assets, right? Bearing in mind that one of, the, one of the biggest obstacles for a bank isn't the technical obstacle. Mm -hmm. The biggest obstacle is, well, how do we integrate it into our portfolio? How do we integrate these offerings into our existing regulation compliance frameworks, into our risk management protocols? And there's been a huge amount of uncertainty out there that's been building, you know, over time that's made it really difficult, especially if you're a global bank, to make your choices. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've in here in the U.S. We've only just seen the first Bitcoin ETF approval coming in January, so we're really early in this process. Bearing that in mind, when we surveyed, and we did a survey um, actually a little while ago now of banks, and mm -hmm. we found out that you know the vast majority, uh, over sixty percent, are looking to put more than 1% of their portfolio into digital assets. And if you okay. look, interestingly, at the very large assets under management banks, so those with sort of 500 billion assets under management, and 45% of, of them are putting 1% of their portfolio, that's a very sizable market cap. Huge, and so when you, when you say to me, it's, uh, oh, are you not seeing it? I think perhaps you're looking in the wrong place. I would, I would suggest that maybe you look at the market cap of what's happening in the digital asset space and to give you a flavor of just what's available today. And, and it's evolving all the time. There's still a lot more products and services to come, but, uh, and it's early days. Um, but I, I think you're gonna see and hear a lot more of it. Uh, and it's about, it's about consumer choice. So we see, Greg and I, I suppose, come from a world where we see these transactional systems and we see the evolution that they're on. How do you see the coexistence? We've obviously got the innovation happening on the blockchain side. Mm -hmm. We've got innovation happening on the transactional mm -hmm. sort of systems of record. How do you see those two coexisting? I or do you see them coexisting? Absolutely, absolutely. It's an and. The mm -hmm. same with uh, any, of, any of the technologies that we lay out, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we, we talked a little bit about you know, blockchain and what's unique to blockchain. And if you, if you go to the mainframe space, You've got a technology that's what just had a birthday, a big birthday, with cake. There was streamers balloons, and candles everything. and everything. And if you go right back to the beginning, that's a technology that, at its very, very core, was all about the the start of thinking about scale requiring standardization, mm -hmm. and um, also, and and it, and it did, it delivered on that. It was the first thought process around having to have compatibility, compatibility of software, and that that leads to scale, 
right? And they've managed to focus all this time on speed, processing power, mm -hmm. right? And it's evolved. Started out for punch cards, we wouldn't be much use today. That's not that's not actually the, the the workload that it's designed for. And if you fast forward to Z16, it's all about AI and being able to produce what's required to run those sorts of workloads. Why? Because the banks have changed, right? And I don't see any difference if you look at again blockchain and you think, well, what is blockchain for and how does it run? Then you have a different question, which is maybe what you're thinking about, which is, well, how do you integrate them? Mm -hmm. like, what is that integration? And I actually think that it starts at the beginning, first of all, as I said, there's a, a big chunk of work to be done when you add any technology into a banking uh, landscape around how do we think about the regulatory requirements, the compliance requirements, the risk management requirements, right? Those, those are real, and that's real work, right? It might not be technical, but it's very real and it's needed to be able to succeed. On a technical level, I mean, the next generation of blockchain products are gonna be the way that we're building our products. This is API integrations. How do you integrate anything into the landscape? Mm -hmm. So it's not a rip and a replace, it's an and, and it's an integration, so you're using Absolutely. the best of the best yeah. for what their, Absolutely. their workload makes sense. We were talking about this off camera when we were chatting, building up to this, it's workloads You've got to look at what the best platform is for that workload. And whilst the mainframe is the best platform, those high yeah. transaction volume systems of record, blockchain, different workload, different characteristics. That doesn't mean one's better or worse than the other. It just means you've got to have the right platform for the right use case. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and really understand it. Uh, and I, I think, you know, we're still so early in the blockchain uh, sort of evolution that, I mean, I'm fascinated by the fact that there's still people today that haven't fully understood the technology for mm -hmm. what it is. We're still so and early. It's complex. Mm. It, it, it's complex to, get, to wrap your head around because the use cases are a little different than others that we've seen previously. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think that that's a part of it. Um, and and with there's still the association, positive or negative, blockchain equals cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's. I think it's the first thing that pops in everybody's mind. It's certain, exactly, it's certainly yeah. the first thing that people, and whatever you think about cryptocurrency and you're allowed to have all the opinions and they're probably valid, there's still a lot in a blockchain DLT type technology that doesn't have to manifest itself. That way you talked about smart contracts, Absolutely. talk about digital assets, collateralizing loans, looking at... Um, kind of real estate, there's a whole bunch of different things you can do with that underlying yeah. technology that a bank would be involved in. Are you starting to see I mean, those come through as uh, well? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, that's our core focus. I mean, we believe very strongly from the beginning that because of its inherent decentralized characteristic, any use case that's going to be sustainable over time is going to be on the public blockchain, right? Now, if you accept that as a, as a, as a principle, you then have to understand that in the world of the enterprise, there's going to be other technical problems that you have to solve for. Mm -hmm. Scale, affordability, uh, and in our case, really important privacy, mm -hmm. right? Because that's what enterprises need, but it has to be done the right way. So having spent an, a, a lot of time investing in that space and solving that problem, it then means that we're open to be able to, to provide the solutions that we feel that are, are required and they're additive because they're solutions that are not being solved today. You know, um, I'll, I'm going to give away my age now, but years ago when I was starting out and we had the whole ERP wave, all of that transformation was happening on the inside mm -hmm. of an enterprise, right? And a lot of work was done to standardize the data, to have one, one you're, there was all those conversations about, you know, one moment of truth within the, all that work was within the enterprise and still is today. And what we're talking about is, well, what happens in between, right? We've got a complex spaghetti of EDI mm -hmm. going between companies today. I was hoping you were going to go there and use EDI right? because that was the panacea yeah. back then, right? I mean, it was, yeah. right? That's the way that we solve for it. But the yeah. reality is, is that if, you, if you've got a blockchain and you've, you, you're putting in place the right um, thinking around the technical solutions to be sold, told, right? The place to put a well-earned contract that you've spent months and months negotiating 
when you want to manage to that contract, it should be on the blockchain where you can see yeah. that the terms that you need to have under privacy are under privacy, but you're managing to one version of it and there's one, there is really truly one contract that you share as one party or more, right? And it's, I think, a very elegant solution. I think it's one that we don't have today. That's why mm -hmm. we're, you know, it's coming, coming soon. Just watch this space. So, so what are, uh, I, I want to hear about the future. So what's what's next? Where do you see all this going? Well, I think we're we're absolutely just at the beginning. So I absolutely see that we're going to be seeing SaaS solutions sold, API integrated into existing landscapes, ERP systems, and everything else. I think that's an absolute given. I think we're going to continue to see great improvements. I mean, we haven't touched on today the underlying improvements around the, the, the network itself. At the layer that, two level yeah, to increase speed. Layer two level is going to be, I mean, we're, that's going to be somewhat, I think, I think that's the path to scale. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've got to understand all emerging technologies are going to go through that path. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you're going to start to see a lot more use cases. I think you're going to see, you know, the, la last year we launched the, um, you know, solution that we've got for Obschain ESG and Obschain ESG is all about you know tokenization of carbon credits that's we're just at the beginning of that journey I wonder if you we know? haven't even imagined the rest of the use cases right I mean carbon Absolutely. credits Absolutely. diamonds wine art cryptocurrency I mean I want to know how long that Twinkie has been sitting on the shelf <laughs> but nobody's talking about those use cases. And, and, and how about, I mean, one of the ones that we've been delivering for a long time now uh, is around uh, notarizing media content. Wouldn't mm. you like to know yeah. whether what you're reading, where it came it's from. It's real, is whether it or real? not it's an AI. Has it been verified? Ownership structure of it, who, yeah. where did it where come did it from? Where did it originate? Where did it originate? Who wrote that Has song? it been changed? Was it an AI? Has it been changed? Yeah. There you go. Well, I mean, Media, you've got pictures. the New York Times. Yeah. Yeah. This is all so, so possible today, and it's very consumable, and it's very affordable. Well, we've got it's some lawsuits like. sort of kicking off right now that are intersecting with that exact space. Where did this content come from? How was it generated? Absolutely. What is the source that went into the large language model? Blockchain alongside that I can see mm -hmm. very clearly as a use case. So how about some final thoughts? Let's, let's bring it home. Closing thoughts around well, blockchain. I think the thing that Claire mentioned that really struck for me was whilst we were doing EDI and ERP as an internal facing thought, D DLT and distributed ledger technology is an external thought. How do you get trusted third parties to interact with each other, put in place a smart contract, put in place shared ownership of an asset? How do you sort of instrument that as an external thought? And that for me was the interesting piece. How do you think about parties that want to trust each other being able to instrument that on a network? Yeah, I mean, I, I want to make sure we're trusting each other and we're both looking at the same version of the truth that you've got versioning and immutability and, and all that. Exactly. Yeah. And thoughts for and, you? And, and I, I mean, I would just say yes and just remember it's never just about the technology. It's not blockchain for blockchain's sake. It's because the value that we're going to get out of doing that is going to save us time and it's going to save us energy and it's going to reduce leakages and mm -hmm. disputes and all of all of that all so there, the has, there really costs. has to be a business value to it and it doesn't matter and, that, and and i think that that applies it doesn't matter which technology it is you're looking at whether you're looking at upgrades whether you're looking at emerging tech whether you're doing something innovative you've got to get to the core of why are you doing it and what's the value I'm going to get out of it? And, Couldn't agree more. And then it's going to scale. Here, here. It is never technology for technology's sake. It is no. always about what value you're driving to your business or to your customers. <laughs> well, thanks, Claire, for joining us. It was a pleasure having you on as a guest. And you're Stephen. Welcome. Thank you for covering for Daniel. Stepping in. You did a good job. Thank you, sir. Another main scoop in the can. Thank you all for joining us. Click on the link below to subscribe, and we'll see you next time on the main scoop.